Hi, everybody. Uh, even though we can't be together uh, for the conference, I think it's still important to be able to discuss some very important topics uh, to keep the momentum going and to keep the intensity up on all of the issues surrounding the shale gas revolution that we're all privileged to be part of. And I'm certainly one of those entities and individuals, definitely proud to be part of it. So I'm going to veer from your typical uh, speech that you see sometimes at, at conferences like this. And instead, today, I'm not going to mince words. I want to speak directly to the leaders of this great industry and set of industries. That's you all sitting there today listening to this. The stakes are really high on these items that I want to discuss. And we need to be ready to fight for and defend and pursue our interests because there's a lot hinging on this, uh, including society's well-being and, and quality of life. Now, there's good news in all this. When you look at the good news, we've got science, we've got facts, we've got data, we've got reason on our side. And there's no need to speculate or to apologize because this industry and these industries collectively have delivered year after year uh, for a pretty long period of time running now. We've got some credibility and we should be touting that credibility. But as you might expect, there's also bad news. There are entities out there that are hell-bent on lying and obfuscating and slandering what I consider to be very noble industries and endeavors uh, that can continue uh, without going unanswered. So today, what I'd like to do is throw out there and propose to you nine irrefutable truths about our industries, about Appalachia, about the region at large that are core to the types of battles that we need to engage in uh, against those that are looking to steal away the fruits of our labors and to provide ourselves, right, the opportunity to continue to achieve like we have year in and year out. So with that, let's get to the list. And I'm going to start with irrefutable truth number one, which is that this is, ladies and gentlemen, where we're at today, this is the picture of epic success. And that might feel counterintuitive at first blush because we're sitting here in 2020 in a pretty tough position. We've got low gas prices, we've got an oversupply situation, we're worried about demand destruction and when demand might be coming back uh, after the, uh, the shutdown and, and the pandemic. Balance sheets are stressed, there's talk of consolidation uh, looming within the industry. Uh, those are pretty stark issues or challenges to deal with, but those are the exact things I think that we had all hoped for, whether we realized it or not, and many of us may not have realized it, when we started out on this journey with the shale revolution 15 or so years ago. Uh, this is success when you look at it pure and simple, and this is disruptive technology. When you take the disruptive technologies that we've embraced and developed and innovated from drilling to completions to everything in between and big data and all these other types of ancillary technologies, and you cumulatively put them together, you're seeing the ability to liberate the methane molecule at very prolific rates and at very low cost, especially when you compare it to what those were historically. And that creates what we'll call a tsunami of supply. And even though demand has been growing for our product, it hasn't been growing quick enough in the short term. So supply overcomes demand, that depresses prices, that's where we're at today. But over time, that demand continues to grow and it will equilibrate with supply, that sets stable prices, we all benefit. This should be nothing of a surprise to us, We've seen this in all other types of industries that you can imagine where disruptive technology took root. Um, we saw it with software. We saw it with computers. We saw it with a semiconductor. We're seeing it with social media platforms. Heck, we even saw it with Henry Ford and what he did with the automobile where it led to over 100 car companies at one point in time that, of course, consolidated down to a, a very small handful today. So when our enemies are out there taking glee in a canceled pipeline project uh, or applauding the fact that an upstream producer went bankrupt uh, or something along those lines, please knock them off their elitist altar uh, with facts. And the facts are that this is, has been to date and continues to be just a manifest success. So irrefutable truth number two is an interesting one. And that is pretty simple though, even though it's as, it's as interesting as it is, and I think it gets missed quite often, if you are pro-carbon, you are pro-human being. And the converse is also true. If you're anti-carbon, you are anti-human being. You can't be a fan of the homo sapiens and not be a supporter of carbon. Now, somehow, the elites have twisted the storyline into carbon becoming the doom of humanity. Uh, quite the contrary, we are the salvation of humanity and the data prove it. 
and this is data over decades, as carbon utilization goes up in society, uh, things like life expectancy go up with it. That, of course, is extremely important and impactful. As carbon utilization goes up, infant mortality rate plummets. That's even more impactful. When you look about look about the uh, the types of things that we bring to bear for society, and when carbon utilization goes up, uh, individual rights tend to flourish, including specifically rights of women, which is also another important facet and impact of, of what we do uh, as an industry. And just to to put that in perspective, if you look at famine deaths across the globe in the 1870s, I'm going to give you CO2 and famine deaths in the 1870s. The atmosphere had about 285 parts per million of CO2, and the planet, the human race, was experiencing 1,400 famine deaths per 100,000 people. You fast forward to today, CO2 has gone up from the 285 parts per million back then to over 400 parts per million today. Famine deaths have gone from the 1,400 per 100,000 people back then to three, three people per 100,000 today. We have basically, with the utilization of carbon, eradicated famine the globe over. And that's something certainly to be proud of. So to steal a soundbite uh, from a former president, the one right before this one, renewables didn't do that. Carbon did that. And that's something that we need to begin to communicate to a range of stakeholders that are out there. Carbon's the savior of humanity. That's true for the past. Uh, that's true for the present. And that is certainly going to be true for the future. Uh, don't let people like the Pope Bono or other rock stars or elite academics tell you anything different. Irrefutable truth number three, renewables are losing propositions. Renewables are losers. We have ceded too much ground and facts when it comes to renewables. First, there is nothing renewable about wind and solar. All energy forms are non-renewable. And that's just the plain truth of the matter. Renewables are actually more so non-renewable when you run the numbers and do the true analysis and compare it to natural gas fire generation. So even the name renewables is a misnomer and a bit of a farce. The analysis is going to be a complicated one, but if you start thinking about the different pieces of the development chain with renewable energy, you start to get a feel for how you can add up and aggregate the carbon intensity and the cost of that type of electrification. So you got to think about the mining of the materials and the carbon intensity tied to it. Most of that done in places like China. Uh, the manufacturing of the panels and the blades. Again, most of that done in China. Uh, the transportation of those. Uh, what this means with respect to the surface impact in terms of the scale that you need for wind and solar compared to natural gas fire generation and the disruption that that causes. Uh, backup generation that you need when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining tax subsidies, the cost of impact on protected markets, and on and on. But you add these up individually, you start to get in total a very, very large number. And the analysis, even though it might be a bit complicated, it needs to be done, and the results need to be trumpeted from the mountaintops, because when you look at renewables, they are going to be losers on two key metrics, a dollar per kilowatt hour basis compared to natural gas fire generation, and a CO2 per kilowatt hour metric when you compare it to natural gas fire generation. So natural gas fire generation beats both wind and solar on those two metrics. We can show that and we need to show that for more of a regional level like the state of Pennsylvania, as well as a national and global level. And we need to put this in the perspective of what those costs are for taxpayer, for homeowner, uh, for business owner, basically to show how much money is being stolen from them under a scam that is basically adding up to the trillions of dollars globally when you look at it in the aggregate. Irrefutable truth number four, a zero carbon anything, it's a myth. So it doesn't matter here if you're talking about a household, a company, a state, or an economy. Uh, there is no zero carbon future waiting for any of them. That's because modern society cannot function without high levels of carbon utilization. Their zero carbon lie and, and where it resides, it defies science. It specifically defies the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, for all you engineers out there, you know what I'm talking about. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed in a closed system that is planet Earth. Um, that's true for all of us, including people like Al Gore and AOC. Now, the outrage here, I believe, on this zero carbon myth really should be directed at academia and universities, and particularly the STEM 
in engineering and science disciplines. The PhD scientists and engineers, they know better when it comes to the zero carbon myth. And to continue to perpetrate that myth is not just unethical, it's borderline illegal when you consider that there are billions in taxpayer dollars that are being procured under this zero carbon fantasy and then being applied to research, uh, academic bureaucracies, et cetera. I think we also need to call out public company CEOs who sometimes you see, and I know you've seen them as well as I have, on CNBC or at Davos bragging and talking about how their company is going to be a zero carbon emitter by a certain date and time. Now, I quoted a, a vice, uh, I'm sorry, a president uh, on a prior irrefutable truth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote a VP, prior VP now, uh, one that's in the news quite a bit. What a bunch of malarkey. Okay, when you hear a CEO of a public company talking about a zero carbon emission or footprint, press them on that. How are they going to do that? Where's the math that shows that? Where's the technology and what costs are you incurring to be able to do that? Because if a public company CEO made similar outlandish statements like that about their revenue line or their cash flows or their net income, they would be facing sanctioning from the SEC or worse yet, they could be facing criminal charges. But this nonsense on the zero carbon company and its future, uh, it doesn't just get unchallenged. It basically gets applauded and lauded whenever you hear that. Irrefutable truth number five, carbon equates to quality of life. That's a pretty simple irrefutable truth. And if you ever doubted to what extent that's true, 2020 was your year because the first half of 2020 erased any doubts when it comes to the importance of carbon and quality of life. And the coronavirus or Wuhan, whatever you want to call it, pandemic and the shutdown that came from it, proved that loud and clear. So when you look at everything we relied upon during that trying time this spring and early summer, think about the role that carbon played. Gloves, surgical gloves, masks, uh, ventilators, hand sanitizer, all manufactured using carbon-based products. Our supply lines, our logistical transportation systems rode on the back of carbon. All these essential supplies and products got to where they needed to be off of carbon. The hospitals were powered by carbon. Our food was refrigerated and fertilized, frankly, by carbon. Everything that was life-sustaining basically was carbon-driven. And carbon saved our butts, uh, just like they did prior to the pandemic and just like they will after the pandemic has come and gone. Uh, what did renewables do in the interim? Not much other than to continue to suck subsidy and basically enjoy a protected market uh, without much bang for the buck. Irrefutable truth, number six, pro-carbon, that is equal to pro-United States and freedom. Uh, pro-renewable, that's a vote in confidence for the Chinese Communist Party. Now, remember not too long ago, all the experts and all the pundits, in fact, it was probably the one bipartisan issue you could find out there. Everybody was talking about how great China was, how it's our partner, how they were liberalizing, um, they were our friend and our futures were just tied together in a, in a very uh, rosy outlook. Well, that appears to have been all nonsense because China right now, the one bipartisan issue that everyone agrees upon today is that China is our rival, really bordering and increasingly becoming to look like our enemy. That's true politically, um, that's true economically, and that is probably true militarily. And you don't have to be a bureaucrat working at the State Department uh, to see that or to understand that. Now, it just so happens that the natural gas-driven economy uh, is one that relies on domestic feedstocks, domestic workers, domestic capital, domestic technology, and domestic equipment, and along with, I might mention, domestic supply lines. A so-called renewable-driven economy is almost the exact opposite. Supply lines are stretched off to China, so not just that our equipment, but also our kilowatt hours now depend on China. Um, workers, of course, this will be manufactured largely in places like China, ironically in factories that are powered by carbon there. And when you look at those impacts and what it means for our workers, our working men and women basically get relegated to something in the gig economy, I would suppose, uh, despite foregoing what would be a wonderful opportunity with a natural gas driven economy. So China, they've figured all this out. They know all this. And that's why they have tagged um, basically, the rare earth minerals and the feedstock of panels and windmills, along with the manufacturing of things like solar panels as strategic initiatives within their, their basically their economic and, and government planning. 
uh, commitment and reliance on so-called renewables, that is a strategic blunder for the United States and a strategic risk. And a bet on the natural gas-driven economy, that is a strategic lever and a strategic win for the United States, and we should remember that. Irrefutable truth number seven, carbon is the ultimate extension of geopolitical soft power. So if I told you that there was a proven, reliable, plentiful, affordable energy source available to all of us that would do the following, how much would you pay for it? So it would basically secure India and Japan against China. It would secure all of Europe against Russia. Um, It would bring billions of people in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America out of abject poverty and and prove instant uh, quality of life and step up in quality of life standards. And it would break OPEC's back, which would end endless wars in the Middle East. How much would you pay for that? And then on top of it, if I told you, in addition to all those other things, um, this is all going to happen within the United States where our working men and women are going to be able to engage in these types of professions. And it's going to add to the tax rolls and it's going to improve our balance of trade because of exports. How much then would you pay for it? And then if I told you on top of all those things, Oh, by the way, to the extent that the globe embraces the natural gas driven economy, the environment improves from SO2 to NOx to particulate to also including CO2, then how much would you pay for it? The fact of the matter is, and the point I'm trying to make, of course, is that the natural gas driven economy and the shale revolution from drilling to crackers, it is as big of a strategic deterrent and extension of American soft power as an aircraft carrier fleet or as the Marine Corps. And if we're allowed to continue to achieve, uh, we are going to be able to do great things, the people in these industries, for freedom, for free enterprise, for capitalism, and for democracy. And those are all good things last time I checked. Irrefutable truth number eight, carbon sustains the middle class. This is a very important one. I believe that the middle class is what makes America unique. It's what makes America special. Uh, And to the extent that we can continue to sustain it and grow it, that's where our future and our upside reside. Now, energy through natural gas that's manufactured right here, it uses workers that are going to be paid truly family sustaining jobs. Most of these jobs don't require college degrees. I think most of us understand that, although many outside of our industries don't or they want to ignore it. And when you look at the number of jobs and the pay levels for these jobs and the decades of opportunity that the workers have in front of them in terms of career, there is not an industry Uh, or or an industry out there regionally or nationally that comes close to what all these collection of industries that are here today represent when it comes to the American worker. And there's a new alliance brewing on this front. It's called Pittsburgh Works Together. And it's an alliance of entities like building trades, uh, manufacturers, energy producers on the natural gas side, obviously pipeline companies and, and everybody in between And this is a very powerful alliance. It's a new alliance. I'm really excited about it. I encourage you to check it out if you haven't done so already. And you can check out Pittsburgh Works together at the website, pghworks.com. And then on Twitter, it's at pgh underscore works. So at pgh underscore works and pgaworks.com. Awesome institution that's just getting started. Uh, Please check it out and please join. We'd love to have you. Now, this irrefutable truth about how carbon sustains the middle class, this really hits to the issue of what an elitist is. An elitist is someone that's got the arrogance to dictate what economic opportunities the working man and woman are going to have at their disposal and which ones they're going to be denied. And that decision is made arbitrarily and on behalf of the individuals versus the individual making that decision for themselves. Um, Our working men and women are not going to be relegated to the back of the economic line because of what an academic or a bureaucrat deems is appropriate. That should not happen. And getting this right obviously has a big impact on the youth of this region. If you think about the crackers and the petrochemical industry itself, the job opportunities that that represents for kids from Westinghouse High School in Pittsburgh's East Liberty uh, neighborhood to West Green School District uh, south of the city in the middle of the gas fields, it allows these kids opportunities to become solidly middle class. That's a great thing, not just for the individual, that's a great thing for the family unit, and that's a great thing for the region and the country. Irrefutable truth number nine uh, is our last one. I've saved, I think, the most important for last. It really is a crucial one. 
Uh, political quietism is a recipe for disaster. Now, our industries and the people out there listening today, you are the doers of society. Without you, society stops dead in its tracks. And while you've been busy creating and enabling and serving for society, our adversaries have been manufacturing mistruths and they've been looking to cure the fruits of our labor. Now, it's easy to do, and I've been as guilty of this as everybody else. I know we've all done this. It's easy to basically just keep our head down, keep working, you know, shut out the lies and the rhetoric and the noise, and you keep toiling along. Uh, that's what I mean by political quietism. And as I said, I've been as guilty of it as anyone. But that is not going to work anymore because we have been busy creating value. But at the same time, in the real world, those adversaries, wherever they are, They've been taking more and more liberties with the truth, with the data, and with the facts. We've all got a duty to speak up and defend our noble professions, our industries, and our teams. It's a moral duty as well as an ethical responsibility. And the fact of the matter is, if you're not engaged in this battle on a regular basis against this insidious enemy, then you're not doing your job as a leader. And I know you guys are leaders. So let's go set the record straight together. Uh, let's go secure the right that allows us to continue to achieve like we have in prior years in this wonderful opportunity that is the natural gas economy. It's been great being with you. I look forward to meeting you in person and seeing you in person sometime soon. Thank you very much.